Our guest today is Dr. Oscar Bernal. Dr. Bernal emigrated from Columbia in 1987 and earned his Ph.D. from UC Riverside. He's an experimental physicist and professor of physics at California State University. His area of expertise is NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, which is the basis for our modern medicine's MRI scans. His research has taken him all throughout Europe, North America, and Asia. We're here to talk about it today. Thanks for coming on our show. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me, Desiree. I always enjoy your show, and I'm very happy to be part okay, of it Okay, great. Uh, how did you do it? How did you, uh, 12 years in school for physics? Yes, that's more, more or less what it takes. Was uh, it hard? That's a training. <laughs> well, yeah, it's hard at times, but, uh, you know, you, you don't think about how long it's taking. Uh, you simply do it. It's the way we all go through training that way. Well, I really commend you for doing that because it's not something that most of us could do, and I don't think I could do it. Well, I'm sure you could do it. Well, anyway, I don't know about that, but I will probably would never know. But anyway, tell us about your research. Oh, yes. Uh, so you study I, NMR, right? Uh, I don't particularly study NMR. I use NMR. Okay. And NMR is, uh, stands for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, and it's a technique um, that allows uh, want to obtain information uh, from an ob a particular object, what's happening inside a particular object or a material, and uh, basically without uh, destroying it or opening it up, you know, basically what we can do is see inside things uh, using this technique. So mm -hmm. what are you interested in, in uh, finding out with the, this technique? Oh, in my particular uh, area of research, uh, I'm very interested in uh, magnetism and superconductivity. Those are two areas of physics uh, that are very, very acti actively uh, sought after. Superconductivity is like the golden goose, uh, isn't it? Yes. Uh, superconductivity, if, if it would be possible to do at uh, room temperature, mm -hmm. would actually solve many of the energy problems of the world. So It would change our, our world, it would, it right? It would definitely change our, our world. It, it, would it really help us a lot, huh? Absolutely, yeah. In what ways? Well, essentially what you will have is uh, uh, devices that can um, work, you know, in principle, they can work uh, without using any power. You know, it's basically very little power in, in practice that, that you, can, you need to use for, to, to, to use these particular devices because they, of, they offer no resistance so, to electrical currents. Is there a lot of uh, electricity loss between the power plant and our homes due to resistance? Yeah, absolutely. There is, uh, you know, each, each uh, cable that brings the power down from, from the power plant uh, will generate some heat as the current goes through it. And that heat is basically a loss of uh, energy that we So would you recover. say it's half? Oh, that number, I don't know. You don't know? No. But, but it's a, a great a, deal, it's huh? A good, yeah, it's a good so uh, what power. is the um, highest temperature that we found superconductive uh, conductive materials at that yeah. operate? At? Yeah, actually, the, the uh, temperature, uh, the highest temperature is so, something in the order of uh, uh, 150 Kelvin. And what that means is uh, something more like, um, you know, uh, one Kelvin, let's say room temperature, we have about 20 degrees Celsius or let's say 60 uh, degrees Fahrenheit is something in the order of 273 uh, degrees Kelvin. So when, when you say 100... Uh, That's 120 below zero, it, roughly? It, more or less, yeah. <laughs> so it's, do it's, we even have this temperature on the Earth? Uh, yeah, well, we can produce it by... But uh, do we... Could we be... We don't even have this at the North and South Poles, do we? No, I don't think it gets that cold. Uh, but what you do is you produce... Uh, you can liquefy air, and that will give you uh, the, the liquid air, but what's in it is the nitrogen mostly, liquid nitrogen will be uh, cold enough to, um, uh, to make these materials uh, work. Uh -huh. So liquid nitrogen has a temperature of 77 Kelvin. Uh, and, and so therefore, when you cool something with that liquid nitrogen, uh, the, the, uh, say a superconducting material, it will work just fine. Uh, so does that take a lot of energy to cool something the, down the to problem, uh, 77 yeah, The problem Kelvin? at this moment is, yeah, cooling and liquefying liquid, uh, liquefying nitrogen is uh, is not very expensive, but it's hard. You know, it's basically you have to be doing it constantly. So, liquid hydrogen is not uh, sorry, liquid nitrogen is not that expensive by itself, but the technology to be able to make wires 
that can be cooled with liquid nitrogen all along the all trajectory. Along the grid is not yes. very practical, is it's it? It's not very practical at this time, that's correct. So getting back to your research, uh, NMR, mm -hmm. stands for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. That's correct. It's the basis for our, our current um, MRI scans, correct? That's right. Yeah, that's right. You've worked on MRI scans mm -hmm. yourself in your 20 years of research, is that what it is? Yeah, I did uh, about one year of research in MRI, yes, myself in, at Davis, UC Davis. How, how did uh, the, I don't know who discovered it, but how, how did this techno how did they discern that they could use this for studying tissue from, Oh, that's you study metals, right? Yeah, I study metals mostly, yes, metals and alloys. Uh, yeah, it's a long uh, history in a way because, you know, as you said, NMR uh, is the basis for MRI. And NMR was, uh, has been uh, around since the late 30s. Uh, it was basically the main, the main discovery that happened in 1945, right after the war. For NMR? <laughs> for NMR. And so since then, uh, it has been uh, clear that the technique is very versatile. It can be used for many, many things. And, uh, but the, the problems at the time were that the, the technology that accompanies, let's say, an MRI machine was not available. So it had to develop, many technologies had to develop before uh, the MRI became possible in the 70s. In the 70s was yes. when MRI scans were first introduced into yes, medicine? Yes, that's correct. Uh, yeah, I guess it all started with uh, Raymond Damadian, uh, who, did, who measured some uh, interesting changes in uh, what we call relaxation times between like uh, uh, normal cells and cancerous cells. And he, he claimed And he that noted that they were different. You know that he knew the that they were different. Exactly. The NMR results were different from cancer right. and normal cells. That's right. So, and he he uh, basically developed pretty much a technique to, to be able to uh, scan tissue with with the magnetic resonance. And then there were uh, two developments later on. Well, uh, basically at the same time that uh, that were introduced by two other uh, scientists, uh, Paul Lederberg uh, and uh, Peter Mansfield. Uh, they um, independently for a letter board, uh, he realized that we needed something specific about putting something specific in the machine. Like if you've ever had an MRI uh, scan, uh, when, when you get into the machine and they start the machine, there's this, this thumping noise that goes on with it. Pop, pop, pop. It's very kind of scary for some people. What, what does that cause from? Okay, that cause, that's basically the, the, the device that, uh, allowed the Nobel Prize to be given to this technique because it's uh, basically it's you need uh, in order to obtain a, a picture of tissue uh, you need uh, what's called a magnetic field gradient and what that means is that okay you can have a magnetic field uh, constant magnetic field and that alone will not give you a picture you have to vary it as a function of position so in other words the field has to be different on one side of your body as it is on the other side. Why, why would that be so? Oh, because then that allows you to tell where then you see, I didn't go into details of the NMR, but what you do in NMR is, is you uh, basically use the nuclei in, in, inside uh, your body to uh, be spies of what's ha happening inside your body. So you basically talk to the nuclei uh, via, uh, you know, uh, you send them waves of radio frequency uh, and the nuclei respond to you based on how what they how they feel in, in or they what they what kind of environment they are in. But if you just do that uh, with a constant field, um, then you don't know if, where the nucleus is, uh, where this spy is located. One could be in, in Russia, the other one could be in China, but you don't know which <laughs> one is which. 